Am I on? Oh, there we go. Hello, welcome everyone. I'm gonna give a little one minute warning here. We're gonna uh, start the conversation and program and then there'll be plenty of time to, to tour the exhibit uh, after. So one minute and for those um, virtually, if you guys could just hang on for one more minute, we'd appreciate it, thank you. again hello there we go perfect all right good evening everybody and thank you so much for being here both in person and those virtually uh, for this preview exhibit of the exhibit um, I want to just first start off by thanking our inaugural Friends of the Library of Congress members who are here today we are just so thrilled to have you guys as members and grateful for your support and this is just the first of many uh, wonderful programs that we'll be having that I hope to see you at so be sure to spread the word with uh, your friends and family about Friends of the Library of Congress. You can check it out at loc.gov backslash support. I'm also thrilled to welcome our LOC alumni, our Library of Congress alumni. We have a lot of former staff here tonight. We're great. It's great to have you guys back and involved and part of our alumni network, so thank you. And of course, our volunteers and docents who um, we just owe so much to and are thankful to have you guys here and all you do to educate um, visitors on the Library of Congress. So thank you all for being here. Yes. Um, <coughs> and those virtually around the country, we have people tuning in from all over the country. So it's, it's great. And uh, the Library of Congress is truly everybody's library. So we're, we're thrilled to have you guys here. Um, just a couple quick housekeeping items before I turn this over to Dr. Hayden. So uh, for those who might have just got here, um, there are postcards on the chairs. There's also some on the tables around. We'll have staff with some extra. There's also uh, some extra back there. For those virtually, you'll receive them in the mail next week, so you're not left out. Um, but we hope that you'll take those home and send them to a friend or family to really promote this wonderful exhibit. Um, you guys are such great advocates for the library, so it's a fun way to uh, you know, touch base with a friend or family and share with them that you got to be here for this preview and, and hope that they visit it online or here in person. Um, and then we also have a couple stations we hope you guys will check out. We have our selfie station with our first ever, um, the first American portrait, our first selfie uh, from 1839. So you can take a photo with it, share it on your uh, Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn. We also have the original, so the, from the treasures in the vault, which is really exciting because these don't come out often. So the original self-portrait that from 1839 over there. So definitely visit Adam and ask him questions about it and take a look. Um, and then finally, the beautiful uh, Not an Ostrich zine, zines are available for sale um, with a special discount price tonight. And for those online, you can check them out online on our library shop at loc.gov. Um, so we hope you'll take home a little piece of uh, this wonderful exhibit with you tonight. And then lastly, I just want to say before we get started um, that you know the amazing photos you guys are going to see today is just a true drop in the bucket of the wonderful collection that the Library of Congress has as part of the prints and photographs division so I just encourage you to after this go online check out some of the other photographs and collections we have and take advantage of the wonderful Ask a Librarian um, feature that we have on our website if you're looking for a photograph if you want to get more in involved or learn about collections you know ask a question and we'll connect you with a wonderful uh, Prince and Photographs Librarian who can help you explore the collections further. So, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, our wonderful Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Laura. And this is so exciting. It's something to see, and please fill in. There's this thing in church where somebody's supposed to put up their hand if there's a seat next to them. So there's some seats and there's some filling in because we are so pleased to have you here in person. This is our first, one of our first in-person events and it couldn't be a better event to have it with our friends, our flock, alumni, and everyone coming together. So I'm very excited because as many of you know, the Library of Congress is the home 
of 170, over 170 million items, but more than 15 million are photographs. And all of the images in this exhibit came from the library's collection. Now think about this, nearly one million photos were considered. Now think about having to go through a million photos. And then finally, there were 400 selected. And I mentioned earlier that it's like the final four. We're in the March Madness. Well, this is the final 400. And they were carefully curated and they were chosen really to take you through a journey through American history. And like American history, some of the images are beautiful and heartening and some are disturbing, some are humorous, and we hope that some of the photos will give you some new perspectives on celebrated faces and places and events, and others will open your eyes to things unfamiliar and moments in American culture and history that you might not have thought about. So, yes, all the way to the first official selfie, 1839, and you may take your photo, you may take a selfie with the selfie. <laughs> but also, you will see the actual. And that will give you a sense of why it's so wonderful to have these images expanded and blown up. I know that's not the technical term, <laughs> but blown up so you can really see it. When you see the original, see how small it is, and then you get to see that. So you will be the first to view it because it's opening to the general public tomorrow. And that's why this is also special because it's the first time that the library has featured an exhibition that captures the breadth and depth of the library's photography holdings. So before we dive into the conversation, I have to recognize the Annenberg Space for Photography where this exhibit was first displayed, the Annenberg Foundation and Miss Wallace Annenberg who really thought about what this exhibit could be and was such a sponsor. The curator, the renowned Ann Wilkes Tucker, and she was the person who spent two years delving into it. And also amazing photographers like Sharon Farmer, who you'll hear from shortly, David Mandel and Cheryl Reagan from our Center for Exhibits and Interpretation who designed this, Helena, Beverly, and the entire prints and photograph staff. And they are here tonight. Their tireless and peerless support of this collection, their care and just love for the prints and photographs at the Library of Congress, you'll see and know. But last but not least, and this is where I really get excited because this is the first time we've had a Friends of the Library of Congress. Please give yourself a hand. Please, because your gifts will enhance the library's collections, they will help the collections grow, and they will bring them to life with programs like this. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Elena, Beverly, and Sharon. Thanks, Dr. Hayden, and please come up, Beverly and Sharon. Do you carry too much paper with you sometimes? <laughs> so, welcome to everyone watching us through the YouTube and everyone here in this great mezzanine of the Great Hall of the Library of Congress. I thank you, Dr. Hayden. Not everyone is a total fan of photography, but I think I can put you in that camp. <laughs> Let's not be shy about it. <laughs> Tonight is a wonderful homecoming for these photography collections. Wallace Annenberg was inspired to sponsor this show when she heard photographer Carol Highsmith speak on the CBS Sunday morning news program back in 2013. Proof that ideas can take a little while to develop, but boy, is it worth it. Carol 
spoke on the news program about how the library's historical images have stimulated her own work during her 40 years of traveling back and forth across the United States to document America. Mrs. Annenberg so liked this introduction to the tip of our iceberg, the library's collections of more than 15 million photos, that Mrs. Annenberg wanted to shine a bright light on us, especially on the unexpected and rarely seen images, as well as the icons. As Dr. Hayden mentioned, an amazing exhibition curator, Ann Wilkes Tucker, who had worked for Mrs. Annenberg before, she was selected for the show, which was held out in Los Angeles initially. So that's why I'm calling it a homecoming to the Jefferson Building. It took at least two years, Beverly will confirm for me. And of course, in 1973, she wrote her first book on women in photography, and she had come here to do research. The docents won't be surprised, nor will our friends. And then in 2012, she wrote the best book ever on war photography. And again, you won't be surprised that she became even more familiar with our collections during that experience. So we were pleased to have her on board. There are that million photos online that the librarian mentioned, so she could look at those from her home in Houston. And then when she would come to the library for, say, a week or two at a time, we would bring out boxes and more boxes and even more boxes and bigger boxes. Thousands, it's true, thousands of photos funneled and winnowed down to the 400 that you'll see on the walls and on the monitors this evening. The criteria for selection, very experienced, working closely with Beverly. That's two very, you know, they've looked between them probably at two million photos in their lifetimes. So they could easily pick out the photos that will catch quick attention. The photos that will stop you in your tracks, make you curious, make you want to know more. But we also had a guideline from Mrs. Annenberg. Be sure, be really sure to show people pictures that have never been out in the public eye before. And fully 25% of the 400 met that criteria. In other words, there's great depth, not just quantity in these collections. Now, the photos are back home, displayed as reproductions. And I am often asked about that. Why not show the originals? I bet some of you can tell me the answer, and the librarian already gave you a clue. We can make them larger. It's really hard to see the surface of an original daguerreotype. And when you look at the world's oldest surviving portrait photo, Robert Cornelius's first selfie, you can prove that for yourself. You're in front of this amazing artifact, but it is darn hard to see the image on the plate. The other reason for having many of the photos on monitors, it's like a slideshow effect, but that means that they're backlit. And they pop in a way that, again, encourages the noticing of details, the discovering of new pieces in the photo. You might have looked at Migrant Mother a hundred times in a textbook, but I uh, think you might feel it fresh when you're standing in front of her almost life size. So, an experience of the photos that will be fresh and new, as well as the content. You'll find images by 165 talented photographers, including women, African American, Hispanic, and Native American image makers. To give but one example, from the window sized prints, you'll be hearing shortly from DC based photographer and official White House photographer, Sharon Farmer who created the portrait of Beatrice Ferguson, demonstrating very skillful hula hoop techniques at the age of 97. So keep an eye out for Beatrice, an encouragement for all of us to keep going. I wanted to say a bit now too, again, Beverly's gonna tell this story herself in a bit, but during her 50 years at the Library of Congress, and it's okay to tell that because you're safely retired now, <laughs> But in that more than 50 years, Beverly and I were going through the show and sort of a check, check, check. Beverly acquired this one and that one and the other. Oh, this is the one you had scanned fresh to put in the Women Photojournalist book. 
So just remarkable contributions. Beverly's gonna take us behind the scenes in that selection. Chronologically, there's a full sweep of photography from the early years of daguerreotypes up to contemporary times and digital images. And this is just about the last point that I wanted to make for you. Very rarely do photography shows blend the old and the new in as, for me, as powerful a way as will happen in Not an Ostrich. They're all mixed up together. And it's just the most wonderful reminder of timely when they were created and timeless, 150, 100, and more years. So you can think about the past and present all together. Many photos are also very serious in their themes. There's the AIDS crisis, the violence and civil rights, a photographer being practically torn apart as four different people each have an arm and a leg, urban decay and rebirth, domestic violence. But those are important photos to include too, aren't they? Because those are some of them literally the photos that helped change laws that brought change to our country. So while I am emphasizing some of the delight and joy in this exhibit, please also take note of the power of photography to cause change, to make us feel differently about ourselves and the world around us. The true final. What's up with that exhibit title? Not an ostrich? Frankly, we hope it, that title is just puzzling enough in an inviting way to make people curious, to want to come and see, well, if it's not an ostrich, what is it? As it happens, I can tell you, I've been in touch with the National Sebastopol Goose Association of America. It is a beautiful breed of goose that has bright blue eyes and a bright orange beak and uh, webbed feet, a very placid domesticated goose, and the curly feathers prevent it from flying. I give you that detailed example because the title of the exhibit is also a signal that photos will offer you more than meets the eye, as Dr. Hayden indicated. And so please linger over at least a few. Look close, let the photos talk to you, start a conversation, if not with the photo, then with the Goose Association. In other words, one thing will lead to another in the most serendipitous, wonderful way. There's much to enjoy, much to reflect on, through the universal language of photography. I thank you for your time and attention this, after, this evening. And we are now going to try a conversation. I'd like to begin with you, Beverly. A little bit of a mic check. And come check. and guide us if we need help. For the on button. That said, I think you push it up. It is up. Can you hear? All right. Lights are on, so it must be working. Can you hear well enough now, or just the mic closer to her? Okay, okay. All right, so Beverly, here's your challenge for the evening, and I know you're prepared, <laughs> but please do take us behind the scenes for the folks at home, as well as those here in the gallery with us, and describe how on earth you really did winnow with Anne that million down to 400. And then we're sharing your up afterwards. <laughs> Okay, 15 million photographs. To s how to select down to 400 for an exhibit, especially when we're looking for rarely seen photographs. When Ann Tucker arrived to start the process, we walked around the prints and photographs division, checking out extensive card files, file cabinets, and finding aids. We walked through the stacks and went to some of the storage areas that are difficult to reach. Anne turned to me and said, how are we going to do this? <laughs> as soon as she said it, I felt calm. I knew exactly what we were gonna do. 
Until that moment, I hadn't known myself, but my 45 years of experience in the prints and photographs division kicked in, and I knew that the structure of the exhibit lay in the criterion posted in the reading room on the top of the file cabinets holding the Farm Security Administration collection photos. They read something to the effect of the land, what grows on the land, man's relationship with the earth, who lives on the land? What do the people look like? What kinds of dwellings do they build? What work do they do? What do they do for entertainment and the like? The list was compiled in the midst of World War II, so it includes what happens when they don't get along. That list sounded boringly basic, but the photographs can be anything but boring. That forms a framework for the exhibit. Initially, we were told to find photographs no one had seen before, but we soon realized that people need uh, points of reference. They need something they've seen before. Some of the pictures they're familiar with are included as well. My work at the library started with documentary photography, especially photojournalism. Look Magazine and the Tony Frizzell Fashion and Celebrity Photography Collections already were in the library's holdings. Most of the photographs in this exhibit are documentary in that they address the who, what, where, when, how of life. The library was considered a research institution, so we did not collect art photographs, but gradually we looked for the images that not only answered some of those basic questions, but addressed the soul. An example of these differences are the news photographs documenting the 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. They show damage to the building and caskets of the victims. Years later, we were able to acquire the Daywood Bay portraits of, the young, of young people of the ages of the victims of the bombing and portraits of older people, the ages the victims would have been had they lived until Daywood Bay's study in 2012. His study is titled Birmingham, Four Girls, Two Boys. It speaks to our souls in ways that move us beyond the rubble of the bombed building and the preparations to bury the dead. They show us the starkness of early death and the lost potential of those children's lives. That is one way the library's photographic collections move us beyond the facts. Thank you, Beverly. I encourage you to keep an eye out uh, for Dawood Bay's photographs. It's a pair of what are called diptychs so a young person and an older person paired together. They're very moving. And what uh, to move from the sadness of that moment, which is sincere and deep. When Beverly came back from New York City, she flagged me down in the hall and said, we have to have this portfolio. There's only one copy left. They're holding it for me. Let's go find the money. <laughs> And we did, we right. did. And from those kinds of relationships, our curators being able to go out in the world, as well as people who come to visit us here, that's how we build the collections and keep building them. And when we go out, we meet the dealers who are selling these images and they come to respect the library as a serious person and call us when they have something they think we need. That's beginning to happen a lot more now, too. Mm -hmm. So my sincere thanks, Beverly, for all that you've helped to build. And the excitement. Colleagues are here from the Prints and Photographs Division today. I was not kidding when I said we brought boxes and boxes and boxes out. We would drop photocopies on Anne's work box and in Beverly's inbox as we came across something interesting to look at. So it became a wonderful collective project, almost. Well, we asked the whole staff. <laughs> what are your favorite pictures? And we got such a wide variety of things, that, topics we'd never thought of including, but many of them ended up on the walls here. Yeah, it's almost a crowdsourced exhibition <laughs> from 
lovers and fans of photography. Uh, all right, Sharon. Yo. <laughs> I'd love to have you tell us the story of Beatrice Ferguson, first up, and then a little bit behind the scenes at the White House, maybe. <laughs> I call the White House Casablanca. That way nobody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> but Beatrice Ferguson, one of my friends, uh, Darla Davenport Powell, worked for the Afro-American newspaper. And they had done a story about Mrs. Ferguson doing a hula hoop and riding her bicycle. I go all the way out to California, to Oakland, and San Francisco looking for pictures for a book that me and 49 other photographers are working on called Songs of My People. And in Oakland and San Francisco, I really did hit my mark. When I came back to uh, DC, Dollar says, I understand you got more time. I'm like, yeah, you got to see Mrs. Ferguson. She hula hoops and rides a bike. And I said, well, how old is she? And when she said 80 something, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> so I called her up on the phone. And I said, hi, Ms. Ferguson, you don't know me, but Darla Davenport Powell, she knew who that was. And she said, whatever Darla said is true. When you coming? <laughs> so I said, can I come tomorrow? So I came the next day about 11 o'clock, and she answered the door. I was blown away because she had circles on her clothing. And I'm like, does that mean that means hula hoop? And then she says, let me get my hula hoop. It means hula hoop. <laughs> and she came out the door with her hula hoop. And I just went to working because you can't talk a lot when people know what they want to do. If you keep talking to them, they will stop what they want to do, and you're missing opportune moments. You learn this as a photographer who's freelancing in D.C., and you're only as good as the last image you got, okay? You're no better, no better, no worse, but that's as good as you are. And I'm like, this has got to be good because Dollar told me. And Dollar was a wonderful perfectionist, too. I'm so glad she moved back to D.C. I can't tell y'all. Mm. But Mrs. Ferguson came out with the hula hoop and started making her moves, and I'm blown away, one, how much she can move during the hula hoop, <laughs> and two, the motions with the hands and the hips and the feet at the same time. And I'm like, oh, boy, this is going to be cool. So I shot a few pictures, but I never used the motor. The more you use the motor, you miss the intent of what you're trying to do. Plus, all the motor does, if you just fire it off like you got something going on and you know you don't, when you fire that motor, you're just saying, I don't care about my shutter. I don't care how much it costs to fix that shutter if I wear it out. Yeah, it's going to cost you about six, $700, but you can handle it, right? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> One shot at a time. I want my brain to connect to my eyeballs to my finger because that's where the secret is in photography. It's not doing what every, everybody says to do. It's your brain, your eyeballs, and the finger moving at the right time. It's so simple. Anybody can do it. <laughs> Anybody. You got skills you don't know about. So that's what happened with Mrs. Ferguson. She didn't ride the bicycle because she had fallen off of it. The neighbors told me she'd have two bags on either handlebars and would pedal her way to the store and then pedal her way back. I haven't done that yet, okay? And she was doing it, what I thought, then 87. They do more research and find out she was really 97 years old. <laughs> Women still got to lie about their age. You know that ain't right. <laughs> that is not right. So I was blown away way after the fact. I mean, the show was happening. Mrs. Ferguson passed away before the show appeared at the Corcoran Art Gallery. But her family came, uh, crying about their grandmother, their mother, how wonderful. The pictures were. It doesn't get better than this. When stuff like that happens because you went and did something, you didn't know what was going to come of it. But good things came of that. And Mrs. Ferguson did not live long enough to see the show. So she lives on anyway, which is I really love that. Because as I get older, I get closer to her age. <laughs> I know I have to keep moving too. So the name of the game is if you can't do nothing else in life, take a walk every day and dig the trees, the birds, and all, and take your camera with you. <laughs> you got no excuse now, because that cell phone can take pictures too. So, so pictures. Yeah, you've given me a perfect segue here, Sharon. I've just. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted you, it would be great if you could build a little bit on your cell phone riff. Uh, 
we're all photographers these days, right? And yet you can see Sharon brought an actual camera not with today, her. Not today, not tonight, because I know oh, it wasn't working. Seriously, oh, left the flash thing out. <laughs> Knew better. Didn't bring it out. To, didn't bring it out the car. <laughs> so there's the life of the professional you photographer have equipment. Fit something. You <laughs> have a fit. What am I gonna do tonight? Wake up three o'clock in the morning, going, damn, damn. Did I really do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then let's switch off to the White House. Uh, How did you blanca. get there? I'm fortunate that some people really do pay attention to pictures. And the guy that hired me said he could tell it was my photo before he looked at the credit because there was always some movement. If you didn't move, I don't shoot. I'm waiting for a gesture. If you're doing a speech, if you ain't got nothing waving and flagging, I'm waiting, but I'm just waiting. <laughs> and you want to be waiting, and you want to be waited right in position. Got the shoulder right, got your butt right, got if you, if you need a ladder, I always carry a ladder. I'm always too short for what I think I see. So I got in the right place. And he said to me, no matter what I see, it's moving. And I wanna, want you to meet me in a few weeks and come see me. Right. I ain't tell nobody. One, I don't believe it. Two, my friends and I had got together to make a portfolio for the inauguration. We ain't hear from nobody. Okay? So why are they going to? No, nah, they ain't calling me. This is a joke. One of my friends playing a mean joke on me. I'm going to get over it. So I didn't tell anybody. Then Bob calls again. Meet me at this date, at this place. Okay. Well, it turns out to be Georgetown. I'm meeting Tipper Gore and Mrs. Clinton and vice president and the president. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you sure you got the right person? <laughs> you sure? Whoa. And I'm pinching myself, make sure, are you awake? You know, this could be a nightmare that you never wanted to have, so. Just be cool. So it turns out we get started. And I'm like, uh, but I keep my distance. I use my longer and medium lenses. I don't get close because I don't know who they are except that they running for office, they ran for office, and now they it. Okay, may it be a better world. I'm always hoping for a better world. So uh, that's how I got started. And I didn't tell him, I didn't tell my mother and my father. I just wanted to make sure everything was straight. Because, you know, I have an FBI record. I love to demonstrate against things that weren't right. When I was at Ohio State, I took no prisoners. We always had meetings about what to do. I ran a black student newspaper called Our Choking Times because the major corporations kept selling junk to the people who lived in the other countries that they shouldn't eat or drink. You know if Americans ain't eating and drinking it, neither should they, okay? So, yeah, I was a little wild, but I had to do that because my parents stood for stuff. They were both educators. And when you stand for stuff like education, health care, and justice, something's not right with you about anything. You're right about everything, and it matters to me. So that's what happened. And so for me to end up at Casablanca, no, 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 y'all got the wrong person. Do you know that I don't like stuff that goes on in government? Y'all don't know that. You did not check out my FBI record. So I was the last one to get through all that official stuff that says, you're not somebody we got to worry about. It took almost a year. Meanwhile, my colleagues have had their past in the first month, two months, three months, four months. Here, I'm a year later saying temporary. Okay, I catch the hint. I'm going to be temporary at some point. Okay, got it. That's how it works here, you know, in the USA. So I got over all that stuff. And the more I shot, everything got better. And the more I got comfortable, you never get comfortable when you work in a place like that. Two reasons why. There's stuff always going on. Two, people react in different kind of ways. And you don't want to be the one missing the shot that says, at this moment they said, da, 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 da. And you're like, you don't want to miss that. So everything is on high alert. I'm such a good fly on the wall, you forget about me. And you just talk about stuff that I'll never talk about. Even if you pull out my fingernails, okay? I'm not going to talk about that stuff. But the bottom line is, if you're in the right place where real action is going on, you're never going to watch a television again in your life. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> I, uh, is there time for a question or two, or should yeah, we? Love, if there's any questions in the audience. Um, Great story, Sharon. Does anyone have a question for Sharon or Beverly or Helena about the exhibit? And if you're eager to just go and see the show, yeah. that would be fine with us, too. Well, oh, Denise. What's something that they were dying to get in the show? What's a photo oh. that you just don't want, you don't have yet? 
for those online, the question was, what is a photo uh, that we would love, that Helena would love to have for the prints and photographs division that we just don't have yet? So working really hard on some contemporary photojournalism and photographers whose names you wouldn't have heard of, but the, let's call them emerging. And so we're working that ro road really hard right now. Make sure that the views of the younger generation are well represented in our collection. And then I have a shopping list we could talk about privately. <laughs> <laughs> Great. The, the photographers have been very generous. We, we do purchase or we'll have gift purchases. If we can buy two or three or four or five, and then they might donate another couple. So that's been working out really well. Whether it's COVID or Black Lives Matter, uh, the topics of today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, well, thank you for that plug for the LOC Labs uh, domain where every time you click on a new um, link on your browser, it pulls up a new photograph uh, from the library's collection. So it's kind of a you learn something new every day uh -huh. approach. Maybe, maybe Great. Well, we we'll send, actually we'll send that we'll out send after this out. event so that everybody has that and can and can add that to their browsers at home and, and take part in our photography collection every single day. This is just very briefly a program that a summer intern developed for the Office of Communications. So I'd like to give full credit to yes. the Office of Communications. And as you can imagine, when you open your Google browser, a small line of delightful pictures begins to parade across your screen. And then if you want to, you can click on one or two and see them larger. So it's fun. Yeah. Thank and you. it's at least five or six years old. So I take tremendous heart that you're still enjoying it. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we encourage everybody, you know, visit the Princeton Photographs online, get a reader card, um, visit the reading room, and really dive into the collections. Um, last question, yes. Yes, very much so. We do digitize the negative in order to make the print. We don't have a wet dark room anymore. But yes, it's still possible. Great, great question. Uh, the question was, can you get a, a copy of things in the collections that have never been copied before or a print from a film or glass plate negative? And the answer is a resounding yes. <laughs> yes, wonderful. Well, thank you again, everybody for being here. Thank you, Helena and Beverly and Sharon for a wonderful conversation. <laughs> Um, for those online, please stay tuned. A video will pop up here shortly so you can uh, see a video of the exhibit. And for everybody else, we welcome you to, to go ahead in if you haven't already. So thanks again and enjoy.
Thank you. 